You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. John Carpenter, The Early Years, Dark Star. Okay, hello, welcome to the second season of the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to look into the horror films, dissecting them one screen legend at a time. Our second horror legend and focus for the upcoming season is writer, director, producer, composer, John Carpenter. The idea is that we will look into his, or look back into his career and the impact that he had on the horror film genre. In order to successfully do this, we need a team of horror aficionados who will form the surgical team each episode. So first up is yours truly, Paul Farrell, lead surgeon and host for the series of the podcast. I'm a self-confessed horror freak who grew up drawn to the dark work of the silver screen and threw myself into the arena, absorbing as much of the genre as possible with relish and glee. Joining me each episode at the Operating Theatre is a select team of horror aficionados who are at hand um, to perform the surgical task of dissecting each movie. Uh, With me this particular episode, I have... uh, lead surgical technician ben skinner welcome good, aboard good morning slash afternoon afternoon slash or, or whatever time it is that you're listening to us um and ben's job is to literally get into the guts of the subject and offer his thoughts in the process um that's the team for this first one uh, that we're going to go through as i said this is the john Carpenter early years sessions and our first subject is the first of his movies which was dark star dark star <laughs> and if Ant was here, he'd probably pull out the uh, the music and yeah, start playing the background. I don't actually. I was gonna start humming it, but it's one of those ones that doesn't really stick in your no, no. It's noggin. not. It's not a signature tune. But what we no. should emphasize is this is this is John Carpenter in his infancy, and this is where he's already uh, showing his craft or his uh, what he's become known as with his mm. um, with his composing yeah. uh, in his music uh, towards the film score and, and the film in general. Um, and we it's, get we it's get almost, it. it's almost like a garage band compared to like Pro Tools, like yes. that, that's kind of, or Ableton Live. Like it, that's the kind of leap that happens between this and what follows. Absolutely, but there's that's definitely right. yeah, you can definitely hear it coming through. Like yeah, and it's in, and I, I recommend people go and check it out too. You can you can actually uh, listen to all of it on YouTube. Um, I'll I'll put an actually I'll put a link on the bottom of this page. Um, about that too but um, yeah look it's definitely worth listening to because it's uh, it's an interesting one and he's definitely topical at the moment he's you know his his film career kind of wavered shall we say in a polite way towards the end of his career Um, but he's kind of found a new lease of life now on tour doing a lot of the uh, composing and uh, of his music and stuff on stage and um, it's going really well from the sound of things getting quite a lot of rave reviews he's yeah. what's two albums into his original music as well yeah he works back, closely so. with his, close, closely with his son yeah they both got the musical bone but That's he's right. I think he's accepted the fact that he's like he hasn't. He's left it open that he might come back to film, but I yeah. don't think he's particularly worried about it right now. Interestingly, this year there's, there was an announcement as well. So we're, this is uh, to we're recording this. Um, well, we're now August in 2016. Um, but interestingly, he's come out as coming on board to help with the screenwriting for the Halloween remake, re- remake, re- remake, re- remake, yeah. remake, um, which can only be positive mm. because, um, or, or you could argue that. With me, if you want, um, only because uh, it's it's it'll, it'll be good to have someone in, original coming in uh, from the original, you know, setup of that franchise uh, to lend their voice to to it. Because I think that was the thing with the zombie Rob Zombie stuff is that it yeah. just was you're lending it to a, a, a fan of the genre, yeah, um, and they've just been given free reign to kind of go it's, off of it. You so wonder it's how, like, you know, how he managed to get the approval, like. There was was there any approval process involved? I'm not sure. I mean, we we did. we uh, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a look at uh, the Halloween franchise, and we and Ben and I got the short straws of talking through uh, the Rob Zombie movies when they come about. Um, but that's due for a, we'll save that for another podcast discussion. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, Dark Star. So those listeners that may be uh, new to to this uh, podcast of Surgeons of Horror. Uh, the idea is that we start talking through, or I start talking through, the narrative or plotline of the film. Uh, my guest podcasters uh, um, 
basically interject and comment along the way. And then we throw in a few uh, conversational bits about the players of the piece, actors, maybe a couple of um, people that uh, lent their weight behind the screen, behind the screen, uh, behind the camera. Um, and then maybe our final verdict at the end before we round it out. Um, so let's let's start talking about the movie. So we get like these intro graphics. Um, there's an attention comms device from from Earth to Dark Star. Um, we're, we're, this is very kind of dated kind of stuff that we're looking at here. Very basic. What we should add is that it's uh, it was a university um, project that came uh, that was made for this movie. I, get, I, I can I can sense that. And yeah. it was originally like say for argument's sake it was about 60 minutes long and then they had to kind of beef it out a little bit when they yeah. realized that they could probably put it out as a feature release. Yeah. Um but yeah so we're we're talking very minimal set design and stuff Yeah. Very, this. very red dwarf. Very red dwarf. Very good. Yeah. yeah, good analogy or association with it. Um particularly early red dwarf as well. Yeah. Um so we have this uh, video transmission come up. Basically, they're saying there's no funds and that you know certain doom lies ahead for them. We we learned that the commander is dead, um, and that the spaceship. And when we get that kind of the spaceship looming into into view with the graphics behind, you know, with the scenery behind it, um, and this is where the great score kicks in as well. At this point, um, we're introduced to two characters, Pilbeck and um, Talby. Um, and they're trying to have a communi- Taubes to his Taubes Taubes. To his friends, yeah. yeah. Trying to have a com- communication uh, with each other, but the comms link is poor. So again, kind of signs that you know they they're pretty much uh, flying by the seat of their pants a bit yeah. um, within this uh, scenario. Uh, Talby sits in like he basically spends most of the time at the beginning of the movie, kind of sat in this kind of pog glass kind of thing at the top of the at top of their ship. Um, it's he's come quite isolated from the group. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like obviously, it, it, it's very. Getting, he's getting across that idea that it's a very mundane job that just happens. Yeah. to be in space, <laughs> like any any miner that's away from their family for long periods of time, eventually they just go a bit stir crazy. Yeah, spending all this time together, and, and that's essentially what they're tapping into. And I think that's yeah. why it resonates so well. Especially, it's done like I, it was originally penned. Um, I should add here that it was penned by Dan O'Bannon, who would go on to do yeah. a- Alien. Um, Probably maybe shouldn't have like appeared in the film. But, uh, <laughs> now I understand you saying it's a student film, and you know. Yeah, yeah. So obviously he 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 plays P- in Pilbeck fact, in it. I'm surprised that so, Carpenter, who often makes cameos in his films, didn't didn't show up in this. Oh, but he does. He does. Yeah, not physically. He does the, the voice, voice. The voice of Talby. I was thinking that he dubbed yeah. over Talby in it. Spoiler. Yeah. So um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so technically he's he's featured in some way. But he's such a good-looking man. Why wouldn't he just... <laughs> well, back then, maybe not now. Uh, he <laughs> yeah. looks like a decomposing corpse now, but anyway. He is. He's, he's, he's rather harsh. lending himself to the art that he made his name to. to. <laughs> <laughs> he's looking more and more he's, he's like he's, a zombie. That's it. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, look, he... Uh, yeah, so we've got this character. Interestingly, like, he's become quite segregated from the other group, and he kind of spends most of his time just staring out into space. Uh, Marvel at the universe. Um, there's a lot of philosophical conversation that happens throughout this movie too. Yeah. Um, we've got the other three uh, crew members kind of huddled in this small computer room and then we kind of get an insight into what their job is and that as they unload bomb number 19, uh, Pilbeck talks directly to the bomb as though it's human, the bomb is dropped and then force fields are engaged and then the ship then light speeds away from the planet as the bomb descends. The planet then explodes, and the spaceship is at a safe distance from the explosion. <laughs> Was that the sound effect of an yeah, explosion? I believe that's exactly <laughs> how it sounded. Um, the crew evidently are sent out to destroy um, any unstable planets that they kind of consider unsafe. We're um, told this by the uh, the female computer. Yeah, that's right. So, like the I am a computer. I am a computer. The um, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to ask: <laughs> Is that Carpenter as well? Doing, doing a female doing, voice? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think. I don't even know if they were credited. Whoever it was, yeah. um, the uh, with, with that though, there's this kind of a bit of a. I automatically think of um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where you know they go around kind of blowing up, yeah, planets yeah, yeah, because yeah. they deem them. In this case, it's because they want to have a highway to. Uh, it's, well, sorry, it's, in Galaxy, it's because they want to create a space highway. Yeah, I think Mike Baird um, might have. Might have um, taken some inspiration. Yeah, yeah, maybe, <laughs> so, maybe. That is an obscure reference that no one will get. <laughs> so um, anyway, so it was, uh, it's kind of that kind of same thing as. And what I was going to say earlier was with Dan O'Bannon is that 
it was meant to be made out as a as a serious um, uh, sci-fi film. Yeah, and I didn't. But not, yeah, it it ends up being more comedy, and that's what yep. drew people towards it, particularly those of uh, the um, of univers the university uh, students. Yeah, it's almost it like a stoner. That, a stoner yeah, very film. much so, and yeah. even so, because one of the characters is a surfer. Yeah, um, and not that those two things always go in alignment but yeah. in some cases they do I think you could probably make so, a mistake and I think I, and I was in that mode initially of like this is a serious film yeah and then I gradually caught on this, this can't no this, yeah. this is being this is obviously being played for laughs absolutely surely. but um, I don't think it, well that was never it's in, intent yeah. uh, it's just that's how it came about <laughs> so it's Cause, interesting yeah because you can't really when you're living in the shadow of Star Wars and Alien and things yeah, like yeah. this like that's it um, so um, so at this point, uh, so they, they they've destroyed this planet. Boiler tells Doolittle um, that there was a ninety five uh, percent prob- percent probability that there is intelligent life, and Doolittle isn't that interested. Um, so they set course for another planet. So like you get this in thing where the boiler's trying to look for hey, there's there's potentially people yeah. we can kind of engage with here, but they're just out for just doing what they're supposed to do and destroying yeah. planets. Um, while they wait for the arrival um, of the new planet that they're going to go and destroy, some music is played while we are treated to the open credits. Um, this, what's, what's the music track? This is uh, one of the one of the composed music tracks that um, has been put together by Carpenter. So this is this isn't a, the, an original. This isn't this isn't like a yeah. track that he's found. Right. No, no, no. This is all like everything in his original yeah. music. And even Which, like there's a bit where um, I think the only one that's not is the bit where he goes, you know, where Doolittle goes off and plays that with all the glass bottles and stuff. I think that's. Oh uh, yeah. I yeah. think that's not original. I think that was they used somebody for that one. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so the spaceship cruises through space while the uh, crew mill around. Uh, we get the ship's kind of log narrated by the Doolittle character. He's the guy that's basically taken on responsibility of of manning the ship. And well, maybe a little bit hesitant to do so. Yes, has, has a bit of confidence issues going on. Definitely, definitely has confidence issues, and he's the he's the surfer guy too. Mm. So he's always got his head in the in not in the clouds, in the waves. Um, <laughs> so he's um uh he's he's basically kind of again announces the ship's systems deteriorating. Uh, we have Pilbeck, you know, stressing that he's concerned about the fact that his seat is next to where the commander died. Uh, again, a bit of more of the comedy bit comes in there. Yeah, um, we yeah. get a bit more music coming in again. Um, the ship's computer then notifies the uh, the area that uh, you know, sorry, the crew that an asteroid system is bound, f- um, and it causes an electrical asteroid field, which is going to disrupt the uh, the computer. And, and the computer, like con- Pac Man, yeah, that's it. <laughs> the, um, the computer convinces the bomb that this was a mistake, um, you know, because it sets off uh, one of the uh, the next bomb to go out into the bay to be dropped. She eventually. So there's a weird thing where, like, we have computers and bombs that have human personalities, yeah. and they're talking to each other. The computer basically encourages the bomb that it's not meant to go off, and so it yeah. goes back into the bay. Um, this is important because it kind of mm-hmm. keeps happening throughout the movie. Um, we also learn that the uh, sweep, uh, the sleeping quarters had been blown up, so that basically the crew kind of sleep in the food storage area as a result, um, which is just adds to the, yeah. Terrible conditions and, yeah. and depressing nature. Yes, yeah, that's of, it. Of the ship. Um, and this is where they, uh, they, you know, they go down there for some time. They're clearly bored out of their minds, as you as you noted, Ben. Uh, Pinbeck kind of, Pilbeck kind of goofs around with some uh, with a rubber chicken. This just pisses off Doolittle, and he then storms out. And he goes into a room and plays some kind of instrument entirely, which is made entirely out of bottles, which I was talking about earlier. Uh, Pilbeck then kind of rests. Boiler seems a bit obsessed with twisting his tash at this point. He's got mm-hmm. this killer seventies tash. Anyway, I noticed the, um, the pictures on the wall of the naked women. Yeah, in the, there you can see it in the wide shot, but then they, when they cut to a close up, it's all blurred. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. They've had to. They've, had to they've been told it. they have to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so what happens next? Pilbeck. Uh, so you know, do little with inventors to go and talk to Talby up in the glass pod. They seem to have a bit of a connection. These two. Um, yeah, you know they kind of they I have guess, a they have a uh, Kevin Smith esque con- conversation. They do, <laughs> yes, they do very good. Um, and it's through this conversation we're told that Talby has become something of a recluse. Uh, he romanticizes about a glowing asteroid cluster known as the Phoenix Asteroids, 
And we also learned that Doolittle was something of a surfer back on Earth, and he misses being out on the waves. Um, we, we then go to Boiler, who starts using a laser gun for practice. Purely, and this is kind of a good thing. I mean, not a good thing that he's doing, but it's a good thing in the sense that it heightens that sense of boredom. You just kind of want to just do something, and yeah. he just wants to blow shit up. Because, it's it's yeah. like you know, it's the thing of like the guy that's looking after the the nuclear silo, like, <laughs> yeah, 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 up that's blowing it. up the whole world because yeah, know, that's right. What do you do? Idle hands. <laughs> that's oh god. Let's say how this world's gonna go. Mm. It's gonna be some dude just going yeah. Yeah, his board. name's Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, that's just, it. That's him. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's the guy. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the computer interrupts them, saying uh, Pil- uh, Pilbeck needs to. Feed the alien that's on board. Um, not sort of euphemism. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Um, she reminds him that he uh, insisted on keeping the alien as it was a good a good mascot. Yeah. And so he's kind of reluctant. Has to, yeah. Like, what are... <laughs> this is where we exactly we see the alien in question. It's basically a beach ball with feet. Yeah. Played by Nick Castle. As in um, controlled, controlled. By yeah. Nick yeah, as in like he's inside. Beach ball. Oh, he's inside the beach ball. Yeah. I thought it was just someone off screen holding the no. beach ball. No, he's kind of inside it, kind of squatted, jumping around. Right. So Nick Castle is, uh, uh, those who aren't familiar, is the guy that would go on to play the shape in Halloween and direct The Last Starfighter. Um, That's right. We, so we, uh, we found this out recently. We did. We did. Um, Pinbeck and the alien have this argument and uh, the alien escapes from the room. We get this kind of comedy scenario that kind of, follows on from this where you know Pingback goes to find it um, the whole section uh, this whole section was crowbarred in to lengthen the script from the short movie yeah, so this I, is yeah, I was going to say the yeah. minute you said that they had to find some running time this is the first scene I thought of because yeah. it just goes on way longer than you expect it to absolutely and it's almost like it gets funnier as it goes along because it is so <laughs> ridiculous Yeah, and it, the, the situation just becomes yeah, even just, more stupid. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But you just you are just waiting for him to die essentially, and it, it just yeah. it never happens. No, but you're like, you you're, think it's you're gonna always. Happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You think it's just around the corner. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing, isn't it? When you're when you're playing with uh, boredom and and you're playing with people that, and in particular with Pinbeck's character, we we find out later on that he's not even meant to be a member of the crew. Um, so it's kind of all this um, thing where you know he's kind of out of his depths completely mm. um, and um, when you use that you're going to be prone to mistakes happening you know and they, they're yeah. definitely not the fully fledged functioning it team did. all it needs is just a Benny Hill soundtrack or something <laughs> you know oh for this one too yeah. yeah so anyway he's kind of chasing after this alien and they uh, the alien climbs across the lift shaft Pinbeck follows using a plank to climb across he finds the alien in the emergency airlock and it runs off and steals the plank, denying Pinbeck the chance to climb back across the lift shaft. So what does he do? He attempts to scale around the outside wall. The computer then turns on the lift shaft and the alien starts to attack Pinbeck who falls and just manages to hang on to the, to the base of the lift. Despite this, the alien tries to tickle him. Oh no, so he's trying to hang on. Sorry, I've jumped ahead. So, the, so he basically falls and he's hanging on the edge of this kind of... Um, entrance bit into the lift shaft and the, the alien starts to tickle him uh, the elevator then begins to descend and it stops just at Pinbeck's head he manages to hold on to the underside as it then ascends meanwhile the alien discovers the faulty laser once again bomb number 20 is lowered and the main computer has to once again encourage it to return to the bomb bay Talby is the only one that kind of picks up on like something's mm. amiss and he's concerned so he goes to find out what's going on with the malfunctioning error, he tries to tell Doolittle about it, but Doolittle's too distracted about surfing. Um, Pingbeck manages to unfasten the trap door to the base of the lift, but he uh, gets stuck trying to climb in. Um, he randomly starts pressing buttons and is able to set off what will remove the floor plate via explosion. Ooh. <laughs> Not a good move. But he's fine. He's it's, fine. A, it's a Looney Tunes explosion. It is. You know? That's it's, right. It's like the Wiley Coyote. It is, yeah. So he, he kind has, of comes out of it. His hair's a bit ruffled. Yeah. There's, there's birds flying it, above his head. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may as well have gone that far. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so he survives the ordeal and out the fury, uh, grabs the tranquilizer gun, he fires it at the alien, which on impact from the dart deflates like a balloon as as you would expect as you would expect Pinbeck then tells the others of his ordeal Doolittle and Boiler are disinterested with his encounter and even more so when Pinbeck 
recounts a story that happened to him. This story just so happens to be one he told them four years ago. Um, meanwhile, Talby investigates the faulty laser. So Pinkbeck gets pissed off with the guys because they're not listening to him. He goes into the recording room, and this is where it's revealed that Pinkbeck is actually a field technician named Bill. Um, a series of interesting comments uh, occur, and it's basically he ba ended up accidentally on, on the ship instead of the real Pinkbeck, um, as I was alluding to earlier. Pinkbeck makes a... He kind of makes more uh, another recording about, and he complains about his mistreatment on the ship. Um, and then we cut to the main computer telling of the damaged laser uh, and not to send any bombs until it's fixed. The crew appear to ignore this and call on bomb number 20 to prepare for a bomb drop. Fucking stoners. Yep. God damn it. Uh, Talby tries to fix the laser but he's blinded by the explosion. He walks in front of the laser and further explosions occur and everything shuts down. But he doesn't die. He doesn't die. He's still alive. I didn't... I, I, I thought it's not a very good laser, is it? I just thought for sure that was a fatal wound. But then yeah. he just turn, He just shows up later on. He does. It's, it's like, interesting, isn't it? Like, there's, yeah, I guess there's things that don't marry up. But we're not. Quite well. This isn't the film to. to it's to, not the film to judge on no. <laughs> on John Carpenter's writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Technicalities. That's, that's, I think we're missing the point if we just yeah. pull apart the, the, <laughs> those plot threads. Uh, or not even. It's not even John Carpenter. It's Dan O'Bannon. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Talby. Uh, um, uh, what was I saying there? So the crew are unaware that what's been going on with Talby, um, and they uh, they start to prep and prime bomb number twenty to explode. The bomb refuses to disarm, and the computer says she's heavily damaged and can only keep the explosion from inside the um, parameter. Computer says no. The computer says no. Can't do it. Uh, at which point Doolittle declares that he will have to ha ask Commander Powell what to do. At which point I went, isn't he dead? Hang on a minute. I'm a minute and bitter. Um, <laughs> um, and it's revealed that Powell has been cryogenically frozen. Walt Disney style. Yeah. Doolittle asks what they should do. And after a while processing about the issue, Powell recommends that Doolittle should teach the bomb phenomenology. Uh, don't get me started on what that is i kind of did read up on it but it's yeah it's it's kind of psycho babble it's it's a it's it's kind of like the meaning of life kind of you know uh kind of psycho babble essentially Chicken and egg. yeah exactly um so anyway so this is what powell recommends that he does with the bomb Doolittle puts on a spacesuit ventures outside to reason with the bomb he asks the bomb how it knows that it exists meanwhile boiler believes that he can stop the bomb that he by <laughs> shooting at it, he's he's kind of lost the plot at this point. <laughs> yeah, he? he just he's he just, just yeah he's yeah. lost it completely. He's gone full Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah, can you imagine? No, don't. Um, he and uh, Pinbeck have a fight as the latter believes that he is a poor shot. The bomb takes on board what Doolittle has said and decides to go back into the bomb bay to proceed these new ideas. Process these new ideas. Talby then wakes up in the airlift alive. Uh, Doolittle asks the guys to blow the seal on the emergency airlock so that he can get in. They do so, but Talby is blown out of the airlock gets, in the process. He gets Sandra Bullock. He does. Big time. And he has a conversation with uh, George Clooney, who's not alive anymore. <gasps> Spoiler! Um, so he's... Um, the bomb takes on board... Um, yeah, so sorry, I've <laughs> totally lost myself. <laughs> Doolittle asks the guys to blow up the seal, and so, as I said, Talby's... And jettisoned into space. Quite comically. Yeah. Pinbeck then tries to communicate with the bomb, uh, but uh, as he's chasing after, because he sees Talby blow, uh, blowing away, so he is chasing after him in space, whilst also trying to talk to the bomb. Um, the bomb believes that nothing exists in the world except him. His only means is to explode, so he declares, let there be light, and then explodes, taking the ship, Pinbeck, and Boiler with him. Kill him. Everyone. Apart from Doolittle and Talby who are floating in space. Uh, but because of the bomb, they kind of are blown in separate directions. Mm. This is gravity, Going man. Off. This is gravity. That's it, man. I'm telling you, That's it. Alfonso Cuarón <laughs> took inspiration That's from it. this scene. Um, the cryogenically frozen Powell is interestingly jettisoned also and floats off into space. We don't hear from him any further. Doolittle and Talby then talk as they drift further apart from each other. Talby is consumed eventually by the Phoenix asteroid, which he was talking about earlier. Um, and he's nav he navigates, uh, he's forever going to navigate the universe for eternity. 
uh, which is a fitting end to his philosophy. Yeah. Um, Doolittle then is left alone as he drifts towards a planet, knowing that he will burn up on entry. As he floats to certain doom, he comes across some ship debris, one of them which forms uh, a surfboard shape. <laughs> so Doolittle takes it upon himself to ride the last wave into the planet's atmosphere and his ultimate oblivion. We see him float downward until a flash of light signifies that he's dead. Close Far credits. Out, man. Close credits. Dude, Dude, did you just see what I just saw? Yeah, you were riding that thing. <laughs> yeah, if, if you were if you were taking it seriously up to this point, you certainly at this moment were going, oh, okay, right. <laughs> Let's see what he's doing here. Yeah. Um yeah. Look, we've got, we've got to take this on face value. It is a university school project. Um, they had the luxury of a few talent talents on board to kind of connect this thing together. In Dan O'Bannon, who definitely had the gift of the script, although this is, again, in its infancy, he would. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Tan- Dan O'Bannon. Like he's, uh, he's, um, he also plays Pinbeck in this. Mm-hmm. He co-wrote... uh, uh, the the screenplay he's the film editor production designer and special effects guy behind this too so he's very hands on with the project Uh, five years later he would go on to write the screenplay for Alien he would also write Blue Thunder The Return of the Living Dead Life Force Invaders from Mars Total Recall and Screamers to name but a few to his uh, screen credits it's funny how there are elements of Alien in this though he basically like he's come out and said like this was his kind of uh, prototype for what Alien would be. Yeah. So he basically kind of took the core ingredients of yeah. what he was doing here and went, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to yeah. move it into this territory. Because it was the same idea of it's almost like a space rig. It's like yeah. they're like um, oil diggers, like in space kind of thing. It's like it may as well be, they may as well be like driving a convoy yeah. through space. Yeah. But it, it dialed the tone. The tone was like all the way to the right into, yes. into dark, nightmarish yeah. kind of material. That's Whereas right. This is very light. And, very absolutely, light. absolutely. Um, so it's, it's interesting having somebody like him on board, and then you know you couple that with with uh, John Carpenter, who was definitely a visionist. Um, and and from all accounts and what I've read about him and what people have said about John Carpenter, he's he's a doer, as in like he'll just get a project going and just start doing stuff and making yeah. things happen. So when you have a, that kind of combination, it's no surprise why this thing got uh, made first and foremost. Uh, interestingly, what kickstarted all for them though is that it just it just hit a certain note with a certain uh, demographic of people, yeah, um, and probably like-minded uh, individuals like themselves who were just want, wanted a kind of a bit of a free ride, man, and just uh, and it just hit a few kind of notes that tripped with um, with a certain type of audience. As I said, what was your initial? It was this. This was your first time watching this movie. Yeah. What was your initial reaction to it when you were? I, I tried watching? to go in not knowing much about it. The, yeah. only, the first time I heard about it was when Dan O'Bannon mentioned it in the. I think it was a documentary on Alien. Uh-huh. Alien DVD. Yeah. He yeah. talked about this other film, so I was always always curious to check it out, but I actually didn't know that it wasn't meant to be serious, as I mentioned for yeah, the yeah, first yeah. like ten minutes or so until yeah. I finally registered. Um, and there was a point where I was like, the only point where I was like, man, this is going to hurry up, is the, the mention that the beach cre- ball yeah, yeah. chasing scene. Way too long. Um, but look, I'm gonna, I, the stuff I made at uni, I would not want to go back and rewatch that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I've made stuff of uh, the level of John Carpenter now, but my point is like, you, you definitely learn from your mistakes and you, oh, yeah. you improve over time. Yeah, but yeah, I can't really. I wouldn't really put this in his official canon of. I mean, it is and it isn't. We're talking about no, all no, his, this is all of his films. But no, that's right. And so the the just to remind people that are listening, like so the 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 idea of, of looking at John Carpenter or even like as we did with Wedge Craven, and we're looking at the, we've looked at the early films, or we are looking at the early films for both of those auteurs, um, and that's purely to look at the journey that they would make and the impact that that would have when they come to make the classic films that they've become um, yeah. known for. Um, so this is for uh, three movies away from what would be Halloween. Um, you know, So it's important to kind of talk about this as, as far yeah. as his journey is concerned. It's um, not going to be on the DVD shelf with the rest of the Carpenter films. No. I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll be adding it to my collection. 
No, but it's it's good to be a completist about these things. And I agree. And yeah, see, I think and, and I think we need to direct and grow over the course of like all these films, which is why we're doing this. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So so from my point of view, I I um, I'm a huge fan of Carpenter, but I watched most of his other stuff before I came around to watching this one. And funnily enough, it was when I was at university that I would end up watching Dark Star for yeah. the first time, um, because that university had an awesome film library. And I just took upon myself watching as much as I could yeah. when I had access to all that stuff. So, um, and this was one of them. Um, so, and it, and equally, I kind of, you know, it kind of suited the the, period, the place I was watching it too. Just being in a university uh, campus library in a private uh, video booth, just watching on the on a TV, you know. Yeah, and I, I kind of like came out of it feeling a bit stoned in like a darkened if room. If there was one um, place that was, you know, perfect yeah. to watch this, if they could say it on the poster, it's like best watched in a <laughs> private viewing booth in a library. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that actually fits quite well. Yeah, and it kind of close quarters, like good. the men in the film. Yeah, it's just you know, it's very true. It's very true. So look, um, so that was kind of my uh, my reaction to it was was a bit kind of I felt a bit stoned coming out of it really because I because I've been in a confined space for an hour and a half. Um, in a, with no lights, with no lights and no windows. There was also so, the, the giant spliff that you had. Yeah, it was the giant spliff in my hand too. <laughs> that, that could have been. It was a bit of a giveaway. Yeah, you know me too well. Um, so the uh, the other thing I'm just going to do is, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of kind of. Normally we would talk about the players of the piece. There's not a lot really to be said about the people, but just to kind of mention them by name. So we had Brian Norell would play Doolittle, uh, just a handful of credits to his name. Um, Carl, uh, sorry, yeah, Carl Cunningham would play Boiler. He had no other screen credits. And then, uh, surprising, yeah, Dre. Uh, apart from uh, uh, Tash Twirler, extraordinaire. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, Dre Pahish. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing these names right. Uh, he's the guy that would play Talby. His only other movie credit was in a film called Bloodbath. Uh, as I said, John Carpenter would actually dub over his dialogue with his own voice as well. And then, as mentioned, uh, Nick Castle played the alien. Um, so just a couple of yeah, as I said, kind of comments around those guys. Um, as far as the next section is concerned, we tend to gravitate to what I call the director's notes. It's just some things I've picked up or read about, um, whether they spark conversation or whether they're just fact pieces that yeah. I share with the guys. That's kind of it. Um, as I said, uh, John Carpenter would team up with Dan O'Bannon to write the screenplay with the film. Uh, it was um, uh, basically a student film for the University of Southern California, just to be more specific. Uh, Talby Starsuit. Uh, backpack is actually made from styrofoam packing material, and his spacesuit chest plate is a cake pan and a muffin tray. That's and this is kind of the extent we're talking brilliant about. Brilliant DIY. The space helmets were part of Ideal Toys S T A R team toy line for young children, uh, resulting in the snug fit on the adults actors' heads. They're quite. T- I feel like um, tightly compacted. They in got Neil, B- Neil Buchanan <laughs> from Art Attack to come in. As a- <laughs> As an advisor on this film, <laughs> they may as well have. All you gotta do is get a bit of loo roll, <laughs> bits of PVA glue. Um, yeah, it's great, <laughs> and some sticky back plastic. <laughs> this is Very an important. art attack. <laughs> the uh, the um, the double rows of large buttons that you see on the bridge consoles are actually ice cube trays illuminated from underneath, oh, look, this which is, I think is awesome. <laughs> uh, it is. I love you, it. You've got to. This is the stuff I want to know. Yeah. So um, the home video cassette revolution was basically what kind of uh, helped to help this one, you know, with the, when it got um, released. Um, the Stone of Market. It, yeah, pretty much. And it, it's what uh, made, uh, saw uh, Dark Star become a cult film among sci-fi films, uh, sci-fi fans too, off the back of that. Uh, Carpenter himself described Dark Star, Dark Star as waiting for Godot in space. Um I think I that's that. maybe trumping him a bit. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm being a snob here because I've got a drama theatre background. Yeah. But Waiting for God, a classic play by Samuel Beckett. Piss. Yeah, maybe he is. Maybe, yeah. Oh, let's, let's give him the due that I mean, that's what he's doing. I know he's taking he's the doing. piss with the film, but maybe that comment itself is... I get it, though, because it is essentially uh, you know, the whole kind of concept of waiting around for something to happen and then nothing happens. Um, mm. But by doing so, it results in their own failure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, yes, um, it's, yep. you could liken it to it. And it's almost, um, it's just, yeah. it's just funny how there's even, even the climax itself is a non-event. Yeah. Like they're just it's floating just, away and it's like, Talby's asking him what happened to the men and it's like, they're dead. 
It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, they died. They died. They died, yeah. Um, there's no great, like, and there's no rising But that's the thing as well, because there's no, the score or anything. apart from those two characters, Yang, uh, Doolittle and Talby, there's no real connection with any of the crew either. Like, they don't no, You don't really, really know. Pinback, at one point, looks like he's the main character, and then... Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And then, so, you're right. So, in that sense, that, that it, maybe it is, in that sense, easy to be dismissive of their demise, because yeah. it's... The film itself is unfocused, the same yeah. way that the characters are unfocused yeah. the whole thing is just I feel like it's all intentional yeah intentionally loose and agreed uh, agreed it's all, it all plays out in this kind of yeah so the last thing I want to add and it's funny that you mentioned Red Dwarf earlier but Doug Naylor who was one of the writers so Rob Grant Doug Naylor were the two guys that wrote Red Dwarf mm. Doug Naylor said in interviews that Dark Star was the inspiration for Dave Holland's Space Cadet uh, the radio sketches that evolved into the television science fiction situation comedy that would be can't, would that, be known as Red Dwarf. That is not surprising. No. Nah. Yeah. So um, so yeah, it's funny that you pointed that out without me having to reference it. Yeah. Well, um, I think that that show is also intentionally the sets are intentionally. Ah, uh, originally, and that's where they went wrong when they when they came back and did yeah. that, all the new stuff they because the point, it yeah. got it got too nice looking. Yeah. And it's like that's not you know. They've got to be dirty, and you know, mm-hmm. I'm not going to talk about Red Dwarf as a. So I don't. I could be here forever. Um, final verdicts on the movie. I, like first, uh, obviously, if we're looking at this first venture into John Carpenter's, uh, what would be his? Uh, he's going to start hitting some kind of home runs very soon off the back of this. But mm-hmm. knowing that this was what started his career, what any thoughts you want to? It's add funny to that this is the way he started his career because he hasn't really. There's a, he doesn't return to the sci-fi. No. Um, you could argue that Escape from New York does yeah. because it uses dystopian uh, kind of future. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, the, it's you know that's a very kind of loose way of crowbarring sci-fi to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's always yeah. been able. He's always been quite versatile. So yeah. It's, even though he's known as the horror guy. Yeah. Like he is prominently a horror guy. He's always said that he's a, he's also a, you know, a big fan of westerns. And that, yeah, and that kind of ties in a lot with his movies to come as well. Yeah. You see that. Uh, and he's a huge, huge um, Howard Hawks But I fan. think it's fair to say this movie stands apart from yeah. the rest of his, from body, the rest of his body of work. I'd yeah. agree, I'd agree. Uh, would you recommend anyone to wa- watch it? Uh, look, what that? Uh, I don't, I wouldn't watch it again, I don't think. Okay. I, I wouldn't watch it again. But I would say if anyone really says that they're a Carpenter fan and they haven't seen all of his films... Like it just gives yeah. you it just gives you a bit more context when you're I, talking I tell about you, him as a Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'll tell you I'll give you a bit of insight into me a little bit and this might make me sound a bit of a pompous wanker, but I'm w- willing to wear that hat. Um I I once He's actually went, wearing a hat. Oh, I am wearing pompous, a hat. It's pompous. pompous. Yeah. It says pompous wanker on it. Um, so, um He's just put it on just now. Yeah. Just just for <laughs> just for your benefit, Ben. The um but I, I went to a, I can't even remember where it was. I was a bit drunk, but I went to a a, a bar in uh, London, and they in the there was jazz music playing, and in the background they had all these kind of like black and white. There was a huge canvas that had been stretched in the background of this wall, and they were showing these black and white uh, images of of jazz dancers, and it kind of got me. I was at university at the time, and I kind of it struck a chord with me. I was like, that's actually really cool. I like the idea of having music and just having something. Yeah. In the background. So then when after that, I whenever I had a, a party at my house or, or my flat house uh, that I would share with my other flatmates, I'd always put on a movie on in the background. We'd listen to have music, but there'd be a, mu- a movie on in the background. This, for me, is a movie that you could put on in the background at a party and yeah. just have these weird images kind of floating by. There and is it a, could kind of yeah. stick up. And that doesn't say too much with the dialogue I must admit there are certain but films that I think do, do play works. well that do play well without audio and yeah. just pretty visuals to look at um, yeah and I think this kind of lends itself to that a little bit because I guess because there's some farcical things that kind of happen in it you know yeah um, you know, particularly the, beach, the whole beach ball thing you could just run that without any dialogue at all mm-hmm. and have some crazy well, like I said, Benny, techno music over the top Benny, of it Benny Hill all. music um, or Benny Hill music for that matter but that, that's another that's another quote for the poster. That's that best enjoyed <laughs> projected at a, on a wall at a at a warehouse party. That's exactly it. That's exactly it, man. With no that's sound. Ex- that's that's exactly what I think. And just put some funky music. Like just put Carpenter's music over the top. Yes, yeah, just, just as the director intended. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
Look, so I think that's us. I think that concludes our uh, our uh, discussions on Dark Star and and concludes our horror surgery for uh, what what is our first uh, John Carpenter early film discussion. Taking your first step into a bigger world. That's it, and it's only going to get bigger from here. The um, the next discussion will be on Assault on Precinct Thirteen, Ooh. the original. Yeah. Um, it did have a remake. We're going to talk about that movie, and I believe Ben, you're joining me for that one, and as is our dear friend Anthony Yee. I'm sure he'll have the synth queued up and ready to go. I reckon, I reckon he's going to be gunning, gunning to play some music for us. <laughs> I can already hear him. <laughs> he's down the corridor waiting. <laughs> um, so that's it for us. Um, once again, thank you, Ben, for joining me. Thank you. And I'm your humble host, as always, Paul Farrell. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. John Carpenter. The early years. Dark Star. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.